Any questions? I believe I started a problem. Did we finish that problem or not? No. Okay. So I'm going to redo that. And in fact, as I was looking at that problem, I thought to change a little bit uh, some information on that so that it would be uh, you know, easier at least to keep track of those numbers. You know, as you've seen, centroid just comes down to just what? Adding stuff, right? There may be some multiplication to it. So the fundamental concepts behind what you do for the composite area, you learn that in the fourth grade, right? Addition and multiplication, right? No? Okay. So it should be easy. So let me redo that uh, problem if uh, it's okay. And I'll try to do two problems and hopefully finish this concept and we move on. So this is what I did. So let me reformulate that problem. We had a shape like this. So someone brought to my attention the distance to the centroid. No, he's not here. So this is what I did. I moved the axes to be here because it makes it easier to keep track of things. So let's see. This was 40. Okay, so we had a circle here, a, this one was radius 60 millimeter, the radius for this smaller circle was 40 millimeter, uh, this was, this distance was 120 millimeter. This one was 40, 80, and obviously that one is 60, right? And we wanted to find the centroid of this shape. So let me start again from the beginning, which is okay. So we know what this is a <coughs> formula. There were relationships that we need. AI xi divided by sum of ai, ai yi divided by sum of ai. Okay. We will again explain all those terms. But what was the step one? Step one is dividing the shape into sub areas, right? We call those ai's, a1, a2, and a3. And this is how I divided this area. I call this A1. I'm going to do it differently from last time. I call this one A2. Okay. I'm going to call this one on the top, this half circle, a3, and I call this one A4, which would be negative, and this part A5. As I said last time, you don't have to divide it into two half circles. You can consider this whole thing at one circle, which would be a negative area. The main reason I do that is because I want to show you how you use that formula for the centroid of half circle. That's the only reason. Otherwise, you know, the, it would be too easy because you have just a circle and the centroid it would be at the center. I don't want that. I want to at least use more equations from, from that table in the back of the book. So, so that was a step one, right? Step two was what? What was the step two? Table. Exactly. Set up the table. Okay, so this was the easy table. Okay, so the first column, you just list those areas. You have A1, A2, A3, and make sure that you label the negative ones by putting a bracket around them, right? A4 and A5 are 
negative because it's an area that doesn't exist. It's a hole in that piece. The next column, you just write the value of all these areas. Remember the units? Okay, I put it there. So you just tabulate them. So A1 is 40 times 120 divided by uh, 2. Was it 60 or 40? It was, that was 60? Yeah, I think it was 60. Right. So I, I knew something was different. Yeah, I called it 60. So area would be 60 times uh, 120 divided by 2. <coughs> so it would be 3,600. Or this one is 80 times 120, 9600. For this guy is pi times r squared over 2, or pi times 60 squared divided by 2, so it would be 1800 pi, right? For these two is pi r squared, okay, over 2, so it would be 8 hundred pi, but will be negative, right? And same as this one. So that's the first column. But what is that first column? That first column, if you add these up, add all these elements, that gives you the total area, because the sum of all those AIs, so it would give you the total area, or the denominator for both, you know, equations. So you know that this is sum of AI, or the total area. I have it here. It com comes out to be, okay, 13,828. 13,828 millimeter squared. So that's the total area. So the, remember that one. So now you move on. The next column is XI. You see in this relationship, you need AI times XI. What is XI, actually XI bar, is the distance or the centroidal distance for each of those sub-areas from y-axis. So you need to locate the centroid of each shape. You know, for a, for a triangle is what? One third of the distance from this side and then one third of the distance from this side. So this would be 20. This is 20. So the x1 bar is this. It's the distance for the cent from the centroid of this shape to y-axis. For this guy, is that the point of intersection of the two diagonals. And so that would be at 60 and 60. So we'd be here, OK? So this is x2 bar, which is 60. This is x1 bar, which is 20, <clears throat> okay? It happens that for all of these half circles, the centroid is going to be, for them, their centroid would be along the line of symmetry. For any shape that is symmetric, you know that, you, remember, you, need, you need to know that any shape that is symmetric, right, regardless of what it is, like, if you have a line of symmetry, say with respect to y-axis, the centroid of the shape is along that line, okay? So centroid of all these three areas would be along the same line, which is also happened to be in the center of this, so it would be also 60 millimeters. So that for x3, x4, and x5 bars. So all of them are 60. So let's write them down. A1 is 20, A2 is 60, and the other ones just happen to be also 60. Yes? Wouldn't Xi actually be 30? XY actually is, oh, this is 120. Yes. So why did I write 20? Beats me. Yeah, beats me too. <laughs> yeah, I know why. Because this is 20, this should be 40, is one third from here, okay? The reason I know why, because I put this, the two of them being almost the same equal. But anyway, so x1, uh, yes, is uh, 40, okay? So the next column is xi times ai. So you know where we are getting now. 
We are calculating this for each area. If you add them up, is this total sum. So simply multiply xi, that means x corresponding to each of the area by its area. So this would be 40 times 3600. This is 60 times 9600. This is 60 times 1800 pi. This is 60 times 800 pi. Area is negative, so this would be negative. And this is 60 times 800 pi. Okay? So if you add these up, what you're doing, you are not calculating this. So this is the summation of all those terms. And this, I have the answer. It comes out to be 757528. 757528. Now, if you divide this by this value, or sum of this column, by the sum of this column, that's what you're doing, dividing this numerator by the denominator, and that will obviously give you, so if you divide these two, it'll give you x bar, which comes out to be 55.52. That means the centroid of this area is located along a line which is somewhere here, okay? Yeah, do it with a different color, would be somewhere here. Okay, where this distance is x bar, which turned out to be 55.52 millimeter, okay? Now, how do we find y bar? Repeat the same process. You, again, form another column, which would be yi for each shape. What is yi for each shape? Is the distance from the x-axis to the centroid of each sub-area. In other words, this is y1, which will be 40 millimeter, right? For this guy is right here. This is 40, this is 60, so this y2 would be 100 millimeter. For this circle, half, half a circle will be where? For a half circle, you can look at that table, you see that for a half a circle, the centroid from the this axis is located at 4r divided by 3 pi. So you have r, you calculate that. So I need to find this distance, which is 4 times 60 divided by 3 pi, right? And add that to 140. If you do that, okay, so let me write first, first of all, all those values that I have. So let me uh, write A1, which was 40, a Y1, which was 40. The other one, 100. For uh, this guy would be 140 plus this. And if I, uh, I have calculated that. Here comes out to be almost 15.5. So this would be almost 15.5 millimeter. So it would be um, 100 and, uh, you know, 40 plus, no, actually it would be 25.5, yeah, 25.5. So it would be 165.5. Okay. Then for the other ones, or the other two, for this guy, A, this is A4, right? So it would be here. So you need to calculate this, and for this guy it would be here, okay? Both of these are four times their R, which is 40, divided by three pi. So for this guy, for A4, would be 140 minus this. And if you do that, that comes out to be 
123. And for the other one, will be uh, 157. Okay. So the next column, all you do, again, multiply yi by the corresponding area. So you multiply 40 by the corresponding area. 40 times 3600, 100 times 9600, 165.5 times 1800 pi, and then 123 times 800 pi, that is negative, and 157 times 8 100 pi, that is also negative. Now, if again you add these up, what you have done is you calculated ai times the <clears throat> yi. So now, if you divide this by this value, which is the denominator, that will give you a y bar which would be 96.6 millimeter. <coughs> that means the centroid is located at 96.6 from here. So this is um, 40 and 40 somewhere here. Okay, this is 140, this is something like that, yeah. This is 60, this is 40, so it would be somewhere here. This is C. In other words, this is okay. This is Y bar, okay, which is ninety six point six millimeter. Any questions? The two axes that I just drew, this axis and this axis, we call them centroidal axes. You may not see the significance of that in this course, but you will see that in the next course. And I will try at least to talk a little bit about that when we start moment of inertia, which is the next topic that I'm going to start this, you know, talking about it today. But any questions? Easy, right? Just set up a table and keep track of the only critical part is you would not make a mistake when you tabulate these negative values. Make sure that areas that do not exist, holes that it punched out, they are negative numbers. And also dividing this up into those simple geometric shapes. That's it. Other than that, it's just a table, right? It's like accounting. We are just keeping track of a bunch of numbers. So that's why I said this is not worth giving any partial credit, right? When you make a mistake, you should, right? You don't give me any partial credit if I make a mistake, right? Okay, so um, that's it. But in order to, you know, make sure that you really become an expert, right? I'll do another problem. Why not? So this one would be something like this. Unfortunately, there are not enough good problems in the book, so I have to make these up. You know, the problems in the book are too simple. <coughs> this is another example. Let's see. This is the one. This is, let's say you have a shape like this. like this, basically a piece of sheet metal that you've cut out a half circle.
from it, and you want to find the centroid of this, air, this area. Okay? What is the step one? Form those sub areas. So I will consider this to be A1. This whole area, this rectangle, A2. And then this little half circle being A3. So that would be negative. Okay? The rest is easy. That's really the critical part. The rest of it is just remember what is the area of each of these shapes and then being able to locate the centroid of each shape by referring to that table which is always given to you. Okay? So let's set up the table. Okay, one, two, and I have only three areas, A1, A2, and A3, which is negative, right? So the next line is the area in meter squared. Make sure that you put the unit there so you know that you keep track of all these values and you know, when it comes to dividing it and so on, you know the unit. <clears throat> A1 is, oops, this was also 60. So it would be 60 by 60 is 1,800. For this one is 10 times 16. Oh, it's a six, not six. <laughs> Boy, 18. This is 10 by 1,660, right? And this little circle is pi r squared uh, or four divided by three point uh, four. Okay, pi times r squared four divided by two or two pi, which would be six point twenty eight, and that is negative. Okay. So the next column is forming x i a i. Uh, I'm sorry, XI, we haven't done the X, XI yet. So tabulate AIs, which is the distance from the centroid of each shape to the Y axis. Centroid of this guy is what? This is two meters, and this is two meters. So X1, which is this, would be 10 plus two, or 12 meters. This is X1. So this is 12 meters. X2 is along the line of intersection of the two diagonals, so in the center of this. In fact, it would be along the same as this line. So it would be X2 is five meters, so five meters. Same thing for this guy, because it would be along the line of symmetry. So this is also the same, so that is five. Next column, x i a i. So you just multiply these two. 12 times 18. 5 times 160. 5 times 6.28, but negative. So you add these up. That is sigma a i x i. Add these up, you have sigma a i. Okay, I have those values calculated here. This is 171.7. Okay. Meter <coughs> squared. This one is 984.6. So if you divide this by that, you have x bar that comes out to be. 5.73 meters. Or the centroid of this shape is located, if this is 5, would be somewhere here. Along this axis, or this is x bar. Okay? 
5.73. Okay. Now, how do you find y bar? You write y sub i, the distance from the centroid of each shape to the x-axis now. So this is y bar 1, right, which is 10 plus 2 is 12, okay? For this guy is in the point of intersection of these two. This is 16, so it would be 8, okay? Y2, which is 8 meters, and Y3, which is for this guy, is, this is 4 times R, which is 2 divided by 3 <coughs> pi, and this was at a distance uh, 5 meters. So it would be 5 plus that, okay? So let me tabulate all of those. You have 12, you have for uh, y2, uh, you have 5, I'm sorry, 12, and you have 8. And this one is 5 plus 4 times 2 divided by 3 pi. So if you calculate that, I have it figured out here uh, would be okay, 5.85. Okay, so that's for that. Yes? Wait, how do you get 5 for... Uh, this is located, you know, right between these two points. In other words, at, at, the, at the center of this line, and between these two. So in other words, the center of that circle is given at five and five. Okay, any other question? Okay, so yi, ai, multiply these two, 12 times 18, eight times 160, and then five, 85 times 6.28, area was negative, so this is negative. So if you add these up, you will have AIs times YIs. And the result is 1,459.7. And therefore, if you simply divide this, by this number, that will give you y bar, which I have that here, comes out to be 8.5 meter. So the centroid of this shape is located at 5 meter from here, and then 8.5 meters from here. Okay, so it's almost somewhere here. This is, okay, so this is, this is Y bar. And this is X bar. So those are the two centroidal axes. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? So now you know it by heart, how to do the centroid of these simple composite shapes, right? It's almost like a bonus problem when you're given this on the final exam. So that's the first problem you begin working on, because you can just get out of your way. All right. So, the next topic, which again has nothing to do with statics, like the centroid, you only learn this for the next course, 
strength of materials or stress is what is called by common mistake moment of inertia. Moment of inertia. Almost every single book in static calls this moment of inertia, which we all know is wrong, because in statics, you, we are not dealing with inertia. You're not dealing with the moment of inertia. That's a term that is suitable for what we do in dynamics. The correct name for this is second moment of an area. And why do we call that second moment of an area? How many of you have had the statistics or probability taken a course? Good, so you're way ahead of everyone. You know why? Because you do know the meaning of centroid. Centroid is what? It's average. You have an area, you want to locate a point which represents how that area is really distributed about certain axis. That's what centroid is all about. Okay. So what did you do when you were, wanted to find centroid? Whether it's the integral form or the summation form, you are dealing with this, right? Or something like this. But what is this term, if you think about it? I told you we are, it's analogous to the equivalent system. We went through that to set up these you know, expressions. But if you think of area being a force, which if it is actually a shape with some weight or mass, whatnot, it is a force, it represents a force, right? And this being the distance, distance times force is what? <coughs> moment, right? Now, moment of inertia of a shape or an area, and I'll discuss that. I will try to at least tell you what the physical significance of that is, right? Involves these expressions, okay? Y squared dA and X squared dA. If you think of this like this, this is Y times Y dA. This is the moment of that area. We call that the first order moment. So if you multiply moment by a distance, you're multiplying moment by a distance. You multiply force by distance is the moment, right? Now you multiply moment by distance becomes the second moment. Okay? That's why we call this second order moment. But the actual term, that's why I asked how many of you about statistics or probability, is more <coughs> relevant and more meaningful in probability. And that's the analogy I'm going to use to tell you what the moment of inertia means physically, or the meaning of that, you know, the physical meaning of that. First of all, as I said, moment of inertia is measured with respect to an axis, OK? And that axis is actually the axis of symmetry. Okay. And it is expressed like this, usually, of course. So that moment of inertia with respect to an x-axis is the distance squared times dA, and this one, y squared dA. What these mean physically? What is the significance of that? Moment of inertia, for those of you, again, who have the statistics or probability, you remember in the probability distribution, let's say this is a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, okay? This was what? This was the mean value or the mean which represents the average of this probability mass distributed about this axis, okay? Mean value doesn't mean anything or doesn't show you anything except that basically 
this is the average value of this distribution. For example, let me be more specific. If I tell you that in your class the average was 80, it's meaningless. It has no value. Because you know you want to know how the grades were distributed about that <coughs> value. Or how this distribution is with respect to this line. Because you may, you have in probability, if you have a shape like this, if you have a shape like this, or you have a shape like this, okay, they all have the same mean value. But this area is much widely distributed. Same thing in this, you know, same concept, which is what you need actually to know, is true about any area. For instance, if you look at, say, you, a, a structural member, if you look at it as structural cross, uh, the area cross section, let's say if you have a piece of a two by six, okay, this is the cross section, okay? Now, if you put that same piece of lumber like this, okay, the mean value or the centroid of these two is the same, isn't it? So when I give you the centroid of these two, I give you a, I have a piece of lumber, which is 12 by six, and the centroid is located there, right? You do not know how this area is distributed about this axis or that axis, okay? What helps you to understand how the distribution is, whether it's narrower or wider, is the second moment of that area, which is the moment of inertia. And that's why we study moment of inertia. Because in the structures, as you will see in the next course, what is really important is that the way the internal stress will, you'll see later on, or the bending resistance of, say, a structure to bending, it has an inverse ratio to the moment of inertia. How many of you have done any construction work, build a dam or anything? Okay. So you know why now, when you build a deck, you put the piece of lumber like this. You never put it like this. Because its resistance to bending is much higher than the resistance to bending. You know, if you look at any bridge or any type of a support structure, you have to look at these beams that are supporting the load. They are always put, for the lack of a better word, vertically. The reason for that is the moment of inertia or the bending which represents the inverse of the bending capability of this structure or the bending stress is always has an inverse ratio with the moment of inertia. The higher the moment of inertia is, okay, the less the stress would be developed or the higher this is, the stronger the structure is. I can show you in a much easier way, right? Uh, yeah, this one is a good idea. Look at this, right? If I put load here, right, I can easily bend it, right? But if I put the same thing here, I want to bend it much, much more difficult. Because the mo this moment of inertia, although area is the same, is much larger than this moment of inertia about the axis that I want to bend the structure. That's why we study moment of inertia. You don't see it in this course. You will see that application in the next course. So at least you know why we study moment of inertia. Because we want to know which area and which orientation is better to put this on. When you're designing a piece of, say, mechanical system, right, and you want, you know what is the orientation of the applied load, it is important to know in what direction you put that cross section 
you put it in such a way that generates a larger moment of inertia. A bridge, a beam, a roof, sort of a beam or girder, right? You know what the load is? In order to resist that as much as possible, or a deck that you built, or I'm not sure what you built, I'm just telling you, right? You did something, right? You always put those vertically because that cross-sectional area of vertically is narrower. So in a way then, moment of inertia is a measure of the scatteredness of the area about an axis, okay? With that said, mathematically, that's what moment of inertia is. So very similar to the centroid, we study two cases. One is the, what we call the, what did I call that? Complex shapes or complex areas, right? And then the second one was composite areas. Okay? So let's just start with composite areas. Okay? In other words, you have a, again, an area that is created as a result of the intersection of two functions. And you want to find the moment of inertia of this area with respect to x and y axis, okay? In this case, that, those are the relationships that we use. I, x is the integral of y squared dA. I, y is the integral of x squared dA, okay? Easier than centroid, uh, mathematically speaking, because all you need to do, there you have to do two integrals, one for the numerator, one for the denominator, right? Here, all you have to do is just define dA, take this integral, as long as you know the bounds of integration, right? So, and in fact, it gets even easier. What I mean by that, let me demonstrate that through similar, same example that we did for the centroid. Let's say you had the same shape, same area. If I remember, this one was y m x, right? And this one was y2, which was k x squared. This distance was a, and this one was h, okay? Let's say we want to find the moment of inertia of this area with respect to x and y. This is the, you know, good news. For i x, you just simply write down the equation, y squared dA. You remember in centroid, I said for x bar, you consider a differential area whose size were parallel to what? Y axis. Here is straightforward. For ix, you consider a differential area whose size are parallel to x axis. For iy, you consider a differential area whose size are parallel to y axis. Not the inverse like the other case, right? So for this case, you just simply consider a differential area like this. In other words, at some point y, okay, you consider a differential <coughs> area. Because you want this to be a function of y, that's why. So area of this differential area would be y. Would be this y2, I'm sorry, x2. I draw what x and write y. So it would be x2 minus x1, right? So if I remember this, uh, well, this, you have the coordinates here, which is a and h. So m was h over a, right? And k was what? k was h over a squared, right? If you calculate those parameters. So y1 is h over a x, y2 was h over a squared x squared. 
right? Okay. So dA is what you need to set up as the first step. dA then is what? Is x2, which is what you get from this guy, right? So you need to find y, I mean x as a function of y. So you will have what? You had the square root of, you had a, the square root of y over the square root of h, right? That's, maybe write it down here. x would be y. You divide y <coughs> by h, right? Uh, a squared, you take the square root of that, that's where this comes from. So I have a, y, over a, and that's what I have here, right? So it would be a, this is, this is what I have here, would be, this would be x2 minus x1, which is what? From here, x1 is a over h1. So you have a over h y times d y. So that's the first step. Similar to Greek centroid, you set up the differential area, and the second step, which is the only step left, is you just write the integral. The integral of y squared times d a. Y varies from here to here, zero to H, right? So this would be integral zero to H of Y squared times the A. I take A out, okay? So you have Y to the power of one half, square root H minus Y divided by H, okay, D Y, right? or a zero to h, y would be five and a half, right? Divided by square root h minus y three over h, right? dy, take the integral, you have a from zero to h, you, have, you just take the integral, let's just do that quick, okay? Would be, 7 half y 7 half divided by I mean 2 over 7 right square root h this one would be 1 over 4 h y to the 4 from 0 to h so you substitute for h you get um, 7 half you know cancels out with 1 half would be 6 half so it would be 2 7 h over 3, I mean h over 3. <coughs> and this one would be 1 over 4 h 3, right? So if you simplify that, that would be 28 divided by 2. 14 minus 28 divided by 4 would be 7, right? So it would be 7 divided by, right. see, what this is what I'm doing, 28 divided by 7. 4 would be 8 minus 28 divided by 7, so 1 over 28, right? So it would be A H Q over 28. So you can see the unit of the moment of inertia is what? L to the 4, say meter to the 4, inch to the 4, foot to the 4. Four. Okay. You do exactly the same for this other guy. I'll do that next time. But for this guy, for I Y, you consider a differential area that would be like this. And we'll do that next time.